before I knock them off. Glad to see you this morning. You know, uh, if you've ever been around me much, I th you, you could probably attest to the fact that I have kind of a bad sense of humor, and I'm the first to admit that. When we were up in Tennessee, invariably, Mom would ask me, you know, what, what did you preach on this morning? And, and what did I say, Mom? The pulpit, right? So, <laughs> every, every time. But, uh, you know, one of the things about preaching on Sunday morning when you're not the, when you're not the regular guy and you're trying to coordinate with the person preaching Sunday night is, you know, you want to make sure you're not preaching the same sermon, right? So uh, tonight, Brother Bud is preaching, but he, he, he kind of proved he's smarter than I am because he came to me this week and, uh, or last Sunday and said, uh, hey, what are you preaching on? And uh, he's like, he, you can preach on whatever you want as long as it's not my subject, right? See, I, th I think he outsmarted me there. But no, this, this morning I'm, I'm going to preach to you about food. And, uh, you know, I've been up for quite a while this morning. Um, we, had a, we had a meeting. So I get, I get kind of hungry this time of the day, right? When I've been up for a while. And I know some of you are probably hungry too. I'm going to preach to you about food. Amen. Is, that, is that a good one, Brother Ed? I want to preach to you about food. And I'm going to do it a little bit differently than I've done it in the past. What I mean by that is when we think about the I am statements of Jesus that we read in the book of John, you know, I'm the vine, I am the door, I am the light, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and so forth. This morning I'm going to preach about Jesus saying, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. But I'm going to do it differently. We're going to be in John chapter 6 this morning. I invite your attention there. We're going to be there all morning. And what I mean by I'm going to do it differently is this. Usually as you know, a preacher or as a Bible class teacher, I've kind of been guilty of segmenting scripture. In other words, isolating particular parts and kind of losing the value of, of the total message. And I don't, I don't want to do that this morning. So we look in John chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And we're going to read about this occasion where Jesus fed the 5,000. So what I mean by this is like, you know, sometimes in the past I would preach a sermon about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And then I would talk about Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee in the following verses of John chapter 6. And then, and then move on to, you know, maybe in a different sermon preaching about Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. But you know, the true way to preach this is why I'm going to do it this morning. Because this is really all one event. And, and I don't want to lose the significance of the feeding of the 5,000, or Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. So let's begin reading in John chapter 6, at verse 1. John writes this, After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him. Note that a great multitude followed him. Why? Because they beheld the signs which he did on them that were sick. In other words, Jesus healing the sick was reason enough for this multitude of people to follow him to the other side of the sea. Jesus went up into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Jesus, therefore, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a great multitude cometh unto him, saith unto Philip, Whence are we to buy bread that these may eat? In other words, where are we going to get enough food for these people to eat? Remember, these are thousands of people. And this he said to prove Philip or test Philip. For Jesus himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 shillings worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, Verse 9, there's a lad here who hath five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are these among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the, the loaves, that's the five, 
And having given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, likewise also the fishes, as much as they would. In other words, till they were full. And when they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the broken pieces which remain over, that nothing be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with broken pieces from the five loaves, which remained over unto them that had eaten. Now note verses 14 and 15 with me. When therefore the people saw the sign which he did, they said, this is of a truth the prophet that cometh into the world. They saw the sign, they saw the miracle, which indicated to this multitude, this is the prophet. Now the prophet of whom they referenced was the same one that Moses referenced in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Moses promised the, pre the people by inspiration, God will raise up a prophet like unto me. Moses said, he's the one that you will hear. So note verse 2, the people, this great multitude, saw the signs that Jesus did in healing the sick, and it, it motivated them enough to cross the sea. It got their attention. They paid attention to Jesus because of the miracle that he performed. And Jesus is using this feeding of the 5,000 for the same purpose. When these people ate from five loaves and two fishes, they said, this is a sign. This is the prophet. This is the one for whom we have been waiting for centuries. Verse 15. Jesus, therefore, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force. They were going to capture Jesus by force to make him king. Withdrew again into the mountain himself alone. Now this word king, it, you know what the word Christ means? It means Messiah. As I often say, Christ is not Jesus' last name, it's a title. Jesus, Savior, the King. These people had correctly identified who Jesus was by the signs that he performed. They were going to force him to become their king. Now keep in mind, they're, they're living under the Roman Caesar, right? They're, they're living under a king. But this is their king. So what does Jesus do? Well, his ministry is not done, so he withdraws himself. Now, we're not going to take the time to read verses 16 through 21, but this is John's account of Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee. Let's fast forward to verse 22. On the morrow, the next day, the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there save one, and that Jesus entered not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples went away alone. So in other words, they look out, they know there's one boat remaining, they did not see Jesus get into the boat with the disciples, but Jesus is no longer there. Well, it's because Jesus walked in the water, right? Howbeit, verse 23, there came boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. In other words, the day before, where they had just eaten the 5,000. When the multitude therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, now note what they do, they themselves got into the boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So these same people, verse 2, this multitude of people that saw the signs were motivated to cross the sea to Jesus. Verses 14 and 15, these same people that witnessed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, they were motivated enough to want to make Jesus king and again to look for Jesus, to follow him. 
These are his disciples. These were the followers. Verse 24. When the multitude saw, therefore, that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they themselves got into their boats, came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi. Now this word rabbi, it's, a, it's a, the title of a teacher. This is a title of respect, of honor. They're saying teacher or master. They're identifying him as one having authority to teach from God. All right? So they want to make him a king. They recognize that he is the prophet. They're, they're ascribing to him this title of honor. Say, Rabbi, when did you come here? Verse 26, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, now this is the first of four times in this chapter Jesus will make this statement. Verily, verily. Truly, truly. In other words, pay attention, pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, ye seek me not because you saw signs, but because ye ate of the loaves and were filled. This is an interesting statement. These were the same people the day before who wanted to take Jesus by force, having identified him as the prophet, and they wanted to make him king. Then they traveled the next day across the sea, seeking after Jesus. And what's his statement? Truly, truly, I say to you, you didn't come after me because of the signs, that I, the miracles I performed to prove who I am. You came after me because you're hungry. That's a motivating factor, isn't it? These people were seeking after Jesus, according, according to Jesus himself, because they wanted to fill their bellies. Right? <coughs> Jesus then says this, verse 27, Work not for the food which perishes, but spoils, but work for the food which abides unto eternal life, endures, unto eternal life. Work for the spiritual food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him the Father, even God, has sealed. Now let's understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, was sealed or attested to by God the Father. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is, I myself will give you the food that endures. You ate the food yesterday, now you're hungry again. I'll give you a food that will cause you not to hunger anymore. Verse 28. They said there unto him, What must we do that we may work the works of God? In other words, Rabbi, teacher, you're telling me to work, but how do I work? How, how do I get the food that you're talking about? They're, they're, still thinking, they're still thinking with their bellies, right? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. If you want to do God's work, Jesus said, pay attention to me. If you want to do God's work, believe what I am telling you. I came down from heaven, and I can save you. That's, that's working the works of God. This sermon isn't about this, but I want to draw your attention to this point right here. We have some very religious friends 
who say that there's no work involved in our salvation. Say, all that you have to do is believe, right? And you're going to heaven. Did, did, you, did you see what Jesus said here in verse 29? Let me read it again. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you do what? Believe. Do I have to do anything to go to heaven? Is there some work that I have to do to go to heaven? You better believe it. Jesus plainly calls belief a work. Now he means not a work of merit, right? He does mean an act of obedience. Two different things. So their question, Jesus, what should we do to get this food? Jesus said, believe on me. You're trying to fill your bellies. I'm trying to fill your soul. Verse 30. They said, therefore, unto him, what then do, doest thou for a sign? Now they followed Jesus, verse 2, because he was healing the sick. They followed Jesus, verses 14 and 15, because they believed him to be the prophet. They wanted to make him their king. They followed Jesus to the other side of the sea because they were hungry. And then they come with a statement, well, if you are who you say you are, what kind of a sign are you going to give us? Talk about a people of disbelief. Are you, are you paying attention? Did you see what I did? Verse 30, what then doest thou for a sign that we may see and believe thee? What work is thou? What work are you going to do, Jesus? What will you do to convince us that you are who you say you are? Verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Psalm 72. Jesus therefore saith unto them, Verily, verily, this is the second time in this chapter Jesus uses this statement. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, it was not Moses that gave you the bread out of heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread out of heaven. Now think about where these people are. These are Jews. Their, their central figure in their culture and in their religion was Moses. That was, that was a person that they elevated above all others. And they say to Jesus, you know what? Moses gave us bread out of heaven. Are you better than Moses? Can, can you do better than Moses did? You know, he filled our bellies. I want you to look back at chapter 5 with me, the last three verses. John 5, beginning at verse 45. Jesus said this, Think not that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, on whom, on him, ye have set your hope. For if ye believe Moses... Ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Again, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? The same people that said, how are you going to top Moses? Jesus' response is, if ye believed what Moses wrote, then you would believe me. The person on whom you set your hope told you that I was coming. Set your hope on me. I'm the bread out of heaven, verse 32. Verse 33, for the bread of God is that which cometh down out of heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, I want you to notice this transition that Jesus is starting to make. Not only has he said that he is the bread, but now he has told them from whence he came. 
They said, Jesus, when, Rabbi, when did you cross the sea? When did you come to this place? Jesus said, I came down out of heaven. Verse 34, they said therefore unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Give us this bread always to eat, Lord. Jesus said unto them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now he's moved on to something different. He's intensified it a little bit. He said, if I'm the bread, you won't hunger, but neither will you hunger, you won't, you'll, neither, you'll neither thirst. Verse 36, but I said unto you that ye have seen me, and yet believe not. All that which the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Verse 38, for I am come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. In other words, God the Father. This was all a part of God the Father's plan, right? Jesus is executing this plan. You have to remember, you know, we kind of know how this thing winds up, right? These people did not know. He's telling them that, they, that he is the one who came from heaven. And they're going to accuse him of uh, a falsehood here shortly. This is the will of him that sent me, verse 39, that of all that which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So now we see Jesus transitioning on to the next point. He, he's describing. If you consume this bread of life, what do you have? You have everlasting life. Now in John chapter 6, we have about 17 times Jesus mentions the word bread. I am the bread of life. 17 times. Now, depending on how you count this thing, we have about as many, if not more, references in this same chapter that Jesus makes to eternal life. I am the bread. If you eat me, you have eternal life. I'll raise you up at the last day. You'll live forever. You shall not die. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone that beholdeth the Son and believeth on him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now while we're here, I want to remind you of John chapter 10, verse 33. In the Jewish culture, any person that identified himself as being of his father was placing himself on the same plateau. In other words, when Jesus said that I am the son of the father, I am the son of God, he was in, this is what he's communicating, I am on the same plane as God himself. Now why does Jesus say that? Because he is God incarnate, right? John 1.17. Je Jesus was or is the word that became flesh. So when he's telling these people, the father, the, that God is my father, and then I am his son, he's saying to them, I am God. I've come from heaven for one purpose, to do his will, to feed you. In verse 33 of John 10, by the way, they took up stones to kill him. They said, you know, we're not going to stone you because you're doing a good work. We're going to stone you because you blaspheme God. In verse 41, the Jews therefore murmured concerning him because he said, I am the bread which came down out of heaven. This is their rejecting the idea that he is God. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? We, we know who this guy is. We grew up with him. We know who his parents are. And he's saying he came down from heaven. 
Words of blasphemy in their minds. Verse 43, Jesus answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him at the last day. I will resurrect him to eternal life. You can reject what I say, but it's at your own peril. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall, this is Jeremiah 31, by the way, they shall all be taught of God, everyone that hath heard from the Father and hath learned cometh unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he that is from God. He has seen the Father. Well, who is Jesus say uh, that, that has seen God? He himself, he's, he said, I came from heaven. I have seen God. I am God. In other words, listen to what I'm telling you. I am that prophet. I am that king. Hunger for eternal life. Don't hunger for, for barley, loaves, and fishes. Hunger for eternal life. Verse 47, here's the third time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth hath eternal life. It's the third time Jesus uses this phrase in this chapter, verily, verily. In other words, pay attention. If you want eternal life, it's through Jesus the Son. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and what happened to them? They died in the wilderness. This is the bread of which cometh down out of heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread, which came down out of heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Yea, and the bread which I give him is my flesh for the life of of the, for the life of the world. Now notice what Jesus did here in verse 51. He yet again intensifies what he's saying. He's been talking about himself as being the bread of life. Now what, what does he tell these people? Now he says, you have to eat me. These were already, he was already talking to people who were rejecting. They're in the throes of rejecting what Jesus himself is saying. And what does he do? He intensifies the message. He says, I am the bread of life. You have to eat my flesh. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove. They quarreled. They fought with one another. The Jews therefore strove one with another saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Yesterday, he gave us bread and fish. Now today, he's saying we have to eat him? Jesus, therefore, said unto them, here's the fourth time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. They rejected what Jesus said when he said, I'm in the bread of life. They rejected what Jesus said when he said, you have to eat my flesh. And what does Jesus do? He further intensifies it. You have to eat my flesh and you have to drink my blood. Except you do that, you have not life in yourselves. Verse 53. <clears throat> he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, the resurrection. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he that eateth me, he also shall live because of me. There is no apologizing with Jesus. There is no apologizing with Jesus. He's in further intensified his words. You have to eat my flesh. You have to drink my blood. If you want life, it's because of me. There's no ambiguity here. Verse 58, this is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This is a place of worship. And as far as these people are concerned, Jesus is speaking blasphemy. 
This is where they came to worship God. And he's speaking blasphemy to their ears. Many, therefore, of his disciples. Now, we had multitudes following him, right? We had thousands of people following. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when uh, they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear this? In other words, what is he talking about? Who would accept this kind of message? It's too hard. It's too much. When he fed us, when he, when he, when he gave us bread and fish, we're okay with that. But what he's saying here, I can't swallow it. Jesus, verse 61, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said unto, him, unto them, does this cause you to stumble? I think the King James says offend. You know what that word means in the original? It means to entice to sin. To trip you up to entrap you. Jesus said, does, does my telling you that you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, does that, does that tempt you to sin? Well, so what does Jesus do? He further intensifies it. He further intensifies it. If that causes you to sin, Wait till you hear what I say next. Verse 62. What then if you should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? Jesus talking about post-resurrection, ascending back to heaven. He said, I came down from heaven to give my life a ransom for many, to allow you to partake of my flesh and blood. If that causes you to sin, what are you going to think when I ascend back to the Father? Having resurrected from the dead. There is no apologizing with Jesus. He said this to his disciples. If that causes you to sin, what do you think about when I, or if that causes you to sin, what will you think when I ascend back to heaven? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken, they are spirit, they are God-breathed, and they are life. They give you eternal life. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning that they, who they were that believed not and who it was that should betray him. And he said, for this cause, I have I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it be given unto him of the Father. Now note this next verse. We're almost done. Verse 66. Upon this, many of his disciples went back and walk no more with him. Now the events we read about here in John chapter 6 are somewhere around the start of the third year of Jesus' ministry. So some of these people, no doubt, had been following Jesus for years. For years. But because of what Jesus said, they followed him no more. For years they had followed Jesus. Upon this, many of, the, of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So Jesus turns to the twelve and said, this is the twelve apostles, would you also go away? Are you going to be like those disbelievers, those murmurs, those people that were following me for the wrong reasons? And, and Peter speaks the famous words, verse 67, or verse 68, rather, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus indeed is the bread of life. And there are many people that are following Jesus for the wrong reasons. There are many people that turn their back on Jesus for whatever reason. But true believers, the true believers, Jesus is the bread of life. As I mentioned, he, he promised many times, many times in this chapter alone that if you follow him, 
He'll raise you up at the last day. If you follow Jesus the Christ. Now the question comes to us this morning, to you in particular. Will you stop following or will you not follow Jesus? Because the sayings are hard. Not easily swallowed. Or will you eat the bread of life and inherit eternal life? Someone who has never obeyed the gospel can become a follower of God, can become a Christian, having heard the truth that Jesus is the Christ, having believed that truth. Jesus said, if you believe on me, you have eternal life. You have to be willing to repent. You have to be willing to change your mind. You have to be what these people were not, willing to change your mind to follow God. If you do those things, if you confess your belief, you can be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts of obedience, right? Jesus forgives your sins. He adds you to the church. If you once obeyed the gospel, but you have strayed, if you become like these people and you stop following God, you can return. God promises forgiveness, 1 John chapter 1. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If you have some need to respond, please do so as we stand and sing.